Hello, and welcome to the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society's 44th Annual Evening of Irish Music and Poetry. Tonight's program is a special jubilee celebration and tribute in honor of retiring Irish Evening Chair Catherine McLaughlin Hayes and founder Patrick Kennedy. My name is Ed Young, and I am an avid supporter of Hoko Polizzo. Along with my sister, Anne Reese, I have taken over Catherine's position as a new co-chair of the Ira of the Evening. Tonight, I will be hosting the program from my backyard here in sunny Seal Beach, California. In these difficult times, we are lucky to have eight of Ireland's finest authors join us with brief readings celebrating Catherine and Patrick, plus music and dance by former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley's band, O'Malley's March, and the Teelan Irish Dance Company. Now, before the program begins, let me give you a roadmap of how the evening will work. Tonight, we will have readings from eight authors, four at the beginning, then a music and dance interlude, followed by four more readings, and then a final music and dance interlude to close out the evening. So, to kick off the program, we are honored to once again have the ambassador from Ireland to the United States, Daniel Mulhall, say a few words. It is a great pleasure for me to um, speak to you this evening on the occasion of the Hoko Polizzo Evening of Irish uh, Poetry and uh, Writing. I have enjoyed greatly the experience of attending previous events in this series, which stretches back many years now. And I believe I'm the seventh Irish ambassador to have taken part in this great Hoko Polizzo tradition. I want to um, pay a special tribute to my friend Catherine McLaughlin Hayes, who has been a wonderful host to me whenever I have uh, gone to the Hoko Polizzo event. And it's always been a great pleasure to uh, deal with Catherine, who's made a wonderful contribution to the work of Hoko Polizzo, stretching back decades. I also want to, to mention um, Harvey Kennedy, who stepped down on the board a couple of years ago. And indeed, I want to pay tribute to all of the members of Hoko Palizzo for creating this enduring tradition of uh, introducing to the people of Howard County the best of Irish writing. And over the years, you've had some of our greatest um, living writers um, uh, performing for you, reading their works for you. And I've had the pleasure of attending a number of times. And it's been a great joy each time to go to the Hoko Palizzo annual Irish evening. 
Um, this year you're having to do this uh, virtually, which is a shame, but I know it will be uh, as good an event as it possibly can be. And of course, it allows you to have not just one Irish writer, but a galaxy of your past uh, Irish writers who've come to Coco Palizzo over the years. And uh, you have a great lineup uh, this evening of Irish writers. Um, and I want to thank all of those writers for being willing to contribute to uh, this evening's uh, gala performance of Irish poetry and literature. This year is a, an important year for Ireland and for Irish literature. It's an important year for Ireland because this is the centenary of the establishment of the Irish Free State. Following a, a long struggle for independence, in particular in the period between 1916 and 1921, in 1922, the state that I now represent came into being as the Irish Free State, subsequently became a republic, and then um, its name is now Ireland. So I am proud to be the ambassador of Ireland to the United States, and I've been proud in that capacity to come to Hoko Palizzo over the last few years during my tenure here in Washington, D.C. So we're celebrating the centenary of our state, and I think we can look back on the hundred years uh, of quite a lot of achievement. We've been a, a democracy for all that time, um, even though our, our state started with a, a, a very tragic and damaging civil war. We've, we came through that and we survived the ups and downs of the turmoil of the 20th century and uh, have come through it as a pluralist democracy with a very progressive outlook, very open and tolerant outlook uh, on the part of our people. Um, Ireland, which used to be a place of emigration, uh, is now a magnet for people from all over the world who've come to live and work in Ireland. There's about 17% of our population now. That's one in six people in Ireland was not born in our state. And Irish people have generally embraced the new diversity of Ireland with uh, aplomb and uh, have welcomed it as a, 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 a reflection of the distance we've traveled to a point where people had to leave Ireland in large numbers to find livelihoods and lives for themselves overseas that people now from different parts of the world want to come and live and work in Ireland and they've made a huge contribution to our country. Uh, as a member of the European Union for the last 50 years, in fact this is the 50th anniversary of Ireland signing uh, the treaty that allowed us to join the European Union in 1973 and that period of EU membership has been a huge transformational experience for Ireland. We've gone from being one of the least developed countries in the then European Economic Community in 1973 to one of the most economically advanced countries in the European Union today. And it's been a great journey, not just a, a journey of economic development, but also a journey of, of the development of our country and the development of new relationships with our European neighbours. And Ireland is genuinely now a, a European country, having re-established bonds with the continent of Europe that perhaps were broken for a certain amount of time during our history because of the, the, um, the conditions of, of um, Ireland uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, our, our links with Europe were disrupted and they have now been really firmly re-established and developed in a very big way. The other reason why um, this is a big year for Ireland, for Irish literature, is because it is the centenary of the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses. And that novel, which actually is almost exactly the same age as the Irish state, because the novel was published about two and a half weeks after uh, the possession of Dublin Castle, the traditional headquarters of the British administration in Ireland, the, that was transferred to the leaders of the Irish Free State in January of 1922. And within a few weeks, this great modern novel written by an Irishman based in um, Zurich, Paris and Trieste, but all the novel is set entirely in Ireland, but was written in three European cities. It's a great European novel about Ireland. It's a great Irish novel. It's a great global novel. And uh, this year I've been doing a lot to celebrate the centenary of the publication in Paris in uh, 1922 on the 2nd of February of James Joyce's Ulysses. I take the view that this book is not just a book um, that is of literary interest. It's a book that has uh, a lot to say to our world today and I've written a book myself called um, Ulysses A Reader's Odyssey which was published uh, last month and which is designed to be an accessible um, commentary 
uh, on Joyce's Ulysses based on my own experience of talking about Joyce's novel all over the world during the past 40 years of my diplomatic career. But a point I want to make this evening is that for me at least uh, as a diplomat, as someone who's traveled around the world and been in different societies and lived in different parts of the world, one of the messages that Joyce's novel carries is a message of tolerance because in a key part of Joyce's novel, in the Cyclops episode, Leopold Bloom is challenged about his nationality and he says, he's asked, what is your nation, Mr. Bloom? And he says, Ireland, I was born here, Ireland. In other words, he makes the point that birth in a country uh, and living there ought to be sufficient to give you an identity of that country if you choose to have that identity. So basically he was standing up against the idea that you had to be of a certain race or a certain religion or a certain ethnic background in order to be part of a nation. So it's a very expansive definition of nationality. And then later in the same episode when he's challenged further by some of the um, other characters in the novel who have rather narrower um, views of Irish nationality, he cuts loose um, and Bloom is a man of with a Jewish background and he felt that he was being maybe uh, subject to prejudice on that, on, on that basis and he cuts loose and he says something to the effect, force hatred history. That is no life for men and women. When the opposite of that is what is really life. When he's asked, what do you mean? He says, love, the opposite of hatred. So I see in Leopold Bloom, Joyce's 20th century everyman, a character also relevant to the turbulent times in which we live in, to the turbulent 21st century, when uh, I think his appeal for a society based on moderation, tolerance, um, openness and diversity, that was Joyce's outlook. It was the outlook he gave to his great um, fictional creation, Leopold Bloom, the anti-hero of uh, Ulysses, the great 20th century novel that came from Ireland a hundred years ago this year. So in conclusion, I want to wish everyone uh, a great evening. I know from the lineup that you have uh, for this evening that it's going to be a memorable experience for everyone. Thank you for inviting me to contribute to it. And I hope that um, you'll be able to have your Hoko Palizzo Irish evening next year in person again. And I hope that the embassy will be able to support you and be involved in your affairs in the future as we have been over the last uh, number of decades. As we say in Irish, Gurumina Magriv, may you have a uh, hundred thousand good things happen to you. Thank you so very much, Ambassador Mulhall. Great to have you back. Our first author, Colm Toybean, visited us in 1999 and again in 2011. A winner of the Dublin Literary Award, Toybean received the 2021 David Cohen Prize for Literature, a Lifetime Achievement Award. He's the author of novel Brooklyn, which was adapted into a film starring Saoirse Ronan. His most recent novel, The Magician, published in 2021, was named a Best Book of the Year by NPR, The Washington Post, Vogue, and The Wall Street Journal. Welcome again, Colm Toybean. This is Colm Toybean here, sending fraternal greetings to the people at Hokopoko, and especially I want to thank for all their work over the years at connecting people like me to audiences, to really getting serious readers involved, um, especially to Pori Kennedy and to Catherine McLaughlin. Um, I was trying to think of what to read and I thought of this. It's the beautiful section from Cyclops in Ulysses where Bloom is in a pub, Leopold Bloom is in a pub and everyone's talking rubbish and he wants to try and intervene and try and say something that's true about the nation, about violence, about politics. And uh, so um, Bloom, Leopold Bloom, Bloom was talking and talking with John Wise and he quite excited with his dunduckery mud coloured mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. Persecution, says he. All the history of the world is full of it, perpetuating national hatred among nations. Do you know what a nation means? Says John Wise. Yes, says Bloom. What is it, says John Wise? A nation, says Bloom. A nation is the same people living in the same place. By God then, says Ned laughing, if that's so, I'm a nation, for I'm living in the same place for the past five years. 
So, of course, everyone had to laugh at Bloom and says he trying to muck out of it, or also living in different places. That covers my case, says Joe. What is your nation? If I may ask, says a citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here. Ireland. The citizen said nothing, only cleared the spit out of his gullet. In gob, he spat a red bank oyster out of him, right into the corner. And then the question of Bloom's Jewishness has arisen. In other words, what is your nation? Could your nation be Ireland? And later on then, Bloom says, and I belong to a race too, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, that this very moment, this, this very instant. God, you know, burnt his finger with the butt of his old cigar. Robbed, says he, plundered, insulted, persecuted, taking what belongs to us by right. At this very moment, said he, putting up his fist, sold by auction in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about the new Jerusalem? says the citizen. I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says Wise, stand up to it then with force, like men. That's an almanac picture to you. Mark for a soft nosed bullet. Old lardy face standing up to the business end of a gun. Gob, he'd adorn a sweeping brush, so he would. He's only had a nurse's apron on him, and then he collapses all of a sudden, twisting about all the opposite, as limp as a wet rag. But it, it's blue. It's no use, says he. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. And, hate. and everybody knows it's the very opposite of that that is really life. What? says I. Love? says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. Thank you, Cum, for your wonderful visits to Hoko Polizzo, or Hoko Po, as you would say, and your very kind wishes to Patrick and Catherine. And now, our next guest, Mary Medeck. She's a rising star on the Irish literary scene. Miss Medeck has received the Hennessy XO Prize for Emerging Poetry in 2008, and has published three volumes of poetry, including her newest, The Egret, Lands with News from Other Parts, in 2019. So please, a warm welcome to the newcomer, Mary Medeck. Greetings from the west of Ireland, from Kilvara, to be precise. Um, I actually uh, grew up in Mayo, but I'm living here now. So. At any rate, I'm coming to you from the West of Ireland and very happy to be doing that. And I'd like to thank Anne and Ed for the lovely invitation to come and read virtually. Uh, I'm only sad that I cannot see your face. Your face is at the other side. Um, and very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, the theme for these readings, as I understand it, is jubil jubilation and celebration, jubilee, celebration. And at, at, at the outset, I thought, oh, I don't do that too well, <laughs> it seems to me. And yet, when I looked back at some of my poems, I realised, yeah, of course, we all have some wonderful things to celebrate. And often they are people, as you were celebrating. Uh, in this um, series and I'd like to share a poem first of all with you about my father. Uh, he died when I was 14 which is a long time ago now and he had a big influence on my life. I think that I probably think of my father every day and this is a poem about, it's a celebration of him, but it's also a poem about what it would be like if he came back. What kind of a world would he come back to? The world I live in now is so foreign to him. So um, I'm going to read it anyway. And I, I kind of set it up as a, a poem about um, cars because he loved cars. Steering wheel. I'm older than you were when you died. 
look at the fields, still the magical light, your elbow on the open window, your imbibing green as I do now, not just a colour or a feeling, but a lifestyle you'd be proud to be part of Dad, who wanted us to name the milch cow. Your old landmarks gone, a road a road carved out of the Rustwan Drumlin, bypassing the bend to your old school. The city, a maze of roundabouts. You never saw one, yet I imagine you'd love driving around them and going on to motorways, to places you might have known but would not know now, and ghost estates resurrected into dormitory towns. Your opal estate, pale blue with red leather seats, which I sat in for years, would be hybrid if you came back. I'd have to teach you text speak, explain Facebook and Twitter, the weird virtual world as parallel to us as the one you're in now. I wish I could FaceTime you and enter the domain of Dad. You'd laugh at my bling, my efforts to chillax. The schoolmaster of long ago would caution me for sloppy retorts like whatever, and quoted of flouting grammar, as in, I'm like, oh my God. I dream of us meeting over a wrap, a sandwich in the bistro, the pub, You'd have tea strong enough for a mouse to trot on. You often said that. And I'd have an almond milk latte from far away Italy. I'd tell you how I left for Philadelphia and studied a science not invented in your time. But maybe it was you who sowed the seed, leafing through a rare sociology book, explicating for me expounding social structure and now decades of new words which you tossed into my young life are trending, beating out a consciousness in borderlands I hardly understand. It doesn't matter because there is something stronger than words, the memory of your hand stretching out to the back seat as we drive along I stretch out mine to where my sons sit as we weave our way through childhood. They ask me, what was your dad like? I tell them, you're like the engine hiding in the bonnet. We don't see it, but we depend on it. I hear them catching their imaginary steering wheels, testing the pickup, excited, revving up ready to go. Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing that touching celebration of your father with us on this Jubilee evening. Our next guest is Paula Meehan, and she has graced Hoko Polizzo with two visits, the first in 2000 and the second in 2014. A poet and a playwright, Miss Meehan served as Ireland's professor of poetry from 2013 to 2016. Her 2020 collection, As If By Magic, Selected Poems, presents poetry published between 1991 and 2016 that showcases her devotion and mastery of her craft. Welcome once again, Paula Meehan. So it's great to be here to celebrate your jubilee, 44 years of amazing curatorship amazing events in community and schools and to find myself inscribed into that archive uh, is just such an honour. I see names Lucille Clifton, Denise Levertoff, names that glow to me when I was a young one and to be in, in the archives with such voices is to me a great, great honour. Uh, not to mention to be part of the Irish reading series and the evenings of dancing and tunes and songs and to be part of that over the years and to through those uh, events to get to know a bit Catherine and Porrick to spend time with them 
uh, great grub, great conversation, hill fort hospitality uh, there by the beautiful sheeted water of the lake. So I'm delighted, as I say, to celebrate their involvement, their hard work and their continued um, success in their retirement from certain onerous duties, uh, the hard work of committees and the day by day work that goes into putting on these marvellous um, series. And I want to read a poem. It's now I'm here in Dublin and it's chilly enough, the heart of winter. And we're all longing for the return of the light. Five days time, it'll be the solstice. So I'm going to read a poem that remembers the great strong sun, the summer sun. It's called Sun Baths and it was published just straight off the press in this wee book, Local Wonders, uh, poems of our immediate time. So it's a poem that came out of COVID and I read it for you in the hope that the sun comes back into our lives in all kinds of ways. So, sun bath. The linguist who washed up beside me on the beach tells me sunna in Old English was feminine, something I'd intuited long ago in class. I tested mother son, sister son on my tongue and saw her ride a white horse across the heavens, her corona, a wreath of sunflowers round her head, and brought home lying there that everything in reach, the linguist, the gull, the sandfly, oestrogen, adrenaline, melanin, breath itself that passed through my aging body was her immortal song. I drowsed in the fret of my petty obsessions, tracking a moat on the inside of my eyelid, a fleck of colour, intense cerulean blue, surrounded by a nimbus of emerald green, like a planet wandering against the fixed stars. If there is any consolation to be found, in the place I go, where light can barely reach me, where I hold on by my fingertips to this life. It is our absolute dependence on our true mother, how she offers a sense of proportion, how in the future, in five or six billion years, her work will be done with this earth the very ground of our being, of memory, of prophecy. Mercury, Venus, our own blue planet engulfed, consumed in our mother's death throes. A redemptive perspective as that ant mooches across my sketchbook, across my light adult lines. So Porrick and Catherine and all the teams and people um, that are there with you celebrating. Um, I just want to say thank you for your friendship, your kindness and for the fantastic experience you gave me in the year 2000 and the year 2014. So thank you again. Paula Meehan, you have brought light to Hoko Polizzo and you've managed the nearly impossible by reminding us there is positive association to the word Corona. Next up, poet Vona Grork. Vona visited us in 2019, the author of 10 books of poetry and winner of numerous awards. Miss Grork's most recent volume of poetry, Link, Poet and World, was released in 2021. Welcome back, Vona Grork. I'm Vona Grork, and I'm very pleased to be with you uh, for your Irish evening in 2022. I'm coming to you from Manchester in the UK, where you might still be able to hear the remnants of Storm Barra playing themselves out just behind the curtain at my back. I know that Catherine is now retiring and I would like to dedicate this reading of three short poems to her in honour of all the work and care she has taken with Hoko Palizzo and with Irish Evening over the past quite extraordinary 36 years. 
And I'd also like to honour Pora Kennedy, whose original bright idea Irish Evening was, and to honour the work of Hoko Palizzo, which is so important in terms of bringing Irish culture to a wider audience. I was there in spring of 2019, and I have really lovely memories of Irish Evening, but also of the warm welcome that I was given and of the lovely people that I met there. So it really is a treat for me to be able to contribute again and to honour Hoko Palizzo's work. I'm going to read three short poems. Uh, the first one that I've chosen is because of that, that wind, uh, which has been raging since yesterday evening, um, and it prompted me to choose this poem, Wind in Trees. Tonight the wind tries on fancy dress in the attic rooms of trees, crinolines and winkle pickers, mustachios and swords, a jeweled fob watch keeping time with my shutters throb and hum. Silks crinkle precisely at my window and at my door, an ivory cane is summoning my name. I ask, will anything ever change? First the trees say no to me, then the wind says yes. The two other poems I'm going to read are set in the west of Ireland and I've chosen them um, mostly because they're also set during summertime and during these low winter weeks I think it's terribly important to remember summertime and the the beautiful promises that that it makes to us every year. The first one is um, is called On Chalk Tea which translates from Irish as the 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 thatched house or the straw cheeping chee straw so On Chalk Tea. Thistledown fuchsia, flagstone floor. This noun house has the wherewithal to sit out centuries, squat between bog water darkness and rooms turned inside out to summer. Straw coloured months of childhood answering each other like opposite windows in thick set walls that sunlight will cajole. Tea roses bluster the half door, rain from eaves footfalls the gravel, a robin, cocksure of himself, frittered away all morning in the shrub. If I knew how to fix, in even one language, the noise of his wings in flight, I wouldn't need another word. That poem and the next one are both set in Spittle, and um, one of the delights of my visit to Hoko Palizzo in spring of 2019 was meeting Colleen Parsons, who grew up in Spittle. Um, we didn't uh, know each other, but uh, it was a lovely thing to meet him from Spittle in, in Maryland in that way. So this last poem I would like to dedicate to Anne and to Ed, about to take a plunge of their own with Hoko Palizzo, and it's about a plunge from Spittle Pier into the cold, cold waters of Galway Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Pier. Left at the lodge and park, snout to America. Stripped to togs, a shouldered towel, flip-flop over the tarmac past the gang-planked rooted barge, two upended rowboats and trawlers biding time. Nod to a fisherman propped on a bollard, exchange the weather, climb the final steps up to the ridge, and then let fly, push wide, tuck up your knees so the blue nets hold you wide open that extra beat. Gulp cloud, fling a jet trail round your neck like a feather boa, toss every bone and sing you to the plunge. Enter the tide as if it were nothing, really nothing to do with you. Kick back, release your ankles from its coiled ropes, slit water, drag it open, catch your breath, haul yourself up into August, do it over raucously. Head first. This time, shout. Congratulations to Hoko Palizzo on all your work. Congratulations to Catherine on her retirement. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this evening and to revisit in my own mind that lovely time that I had uh, during my visit in spring 2019. Thank you very much and good evening. Yes, Fona, you're right. 
Catherine and Patrick created something remarkable for us to dive into. Thank you for your kind words. Well, now I think it's high time for a bit of Irish music and dance. Please join me in welcoming O'Malley's March and Teelan Dance Company. And don't forget, more authors' readings are just around the corner. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's annual Night of Irish Music and Poetry. And as you might have guessed, this is the music section. Welcome. The first song we want to do is called Wait For Me. It's a song that I wrote about my great-grandfather's coming to America, but it could really be about so many of our great-grandmothers and, and grandfathers coming to America. There's going to be a, a poem before it by Evan Bolin, and uh, this is Jared Denhardt on the Celtic harp, and he's going to be playing an air, Jared, called Eleanor Plunkett. Eleanor Plunkett. <laughs> Like oil lamps, we put them out back of our houses, of our minds. We had lamps newer than, better than, and then a time came, this time. And now we need them, their dread makeshift example. They could have thrived on our necessities, and what they survived, we could never endure. It is time now to remember them, how they stood, what they stood with, that their example might become our light. Iron, cardboard, their hardships parceled in them. Patience, fortitude, long suffering in the bruise colored dawn of a new world, and all the old songs, and nothing to the There's a young man at the harbor and he stares across the sea With family all around him Gripping fears of what might be Before he leaves to save his future He wipes a tear so she might see Finally turns to kiss his mother Wait for me From the first days of his exile, he makes his way with hope and pride. Finds love in his new country, asks his young girl to be his bride. And the years, they fly by quickly, in this new land of the free. He grieves alone for his parents, wait for me. Well, his sons, they won the world wars 
His daughters grew up fine and strong. His descendants, they were many, and his days were bright and long. When they waked him, there was whiskey, bells of Ireland, his greenery, Irish songs of sweet remembrance. Wait for me, take me back. an old man at the airport he's back across those years so long he's kept his grandpa's promise his kids still sing the songs before he beats farewell to ireland and flies home across the sea he can hear his own heart saying wait for me
song we wrote about Irish immigrant people coming to Baltimore, Maryland, land of the free, home of the brave. It's a song called The Streets of Baltimore. To work the land from dawn to dusk was father's highest goal. And I set myself to do the same when the dear Lord took his soul. But the land we worked was not our own and the fruit of my two hands was carted off to England to suit the landlord's plans. By the black year of 47, the landlord's game was plain. Starvation, what's the monthly pay in a country filled with grain? Mid sobs of hungry children, we left the shamrock shore. Traded desperation for the home of Baltimore. Come up on the deck this morning, give your hand to me. See the flag that flies upon this new land of the free. Come up on the deck this morning, dance upon the shore. Now walk with me to freedom through the streets of Baltimore. Our voyage was a hard one on Atlantic's icy waves. Free passage on a coffin ship, the landlord's useless slaves. Trading every scrap we had to keep the children well. Praying for salvation from that rolling wretched hell. With every passing day, it seemed we buried friends at sea. Wondered if we stayed at home, how worse our plight could be. With fever raging far and aft, we finally reached the bay. And thanked the Lord who died for us, we've been done till that day. Come up on the deck this morning and give your hand to me. See the flag that flies above this new land of the free. Come up on the deck this morning, dance upon the shore. Walk with me to free the British roots of all the poor. Well, from that day to this one, I've made it on my own. With a helping hand from Father Mac on the mighty piano. A little house near St. John's, a grandchild on the way. We often light a candle as we think about that day. For I leave our friends in Ireland, it left us numb with pain. Parents that we left behind, we never saw again. If I live to be 100 on America's brave shore, I never will forget the day we came to Baltimore. Come up on the deck this morning, give your hand to me. See the flag that flies above this new land of the free. Come up on the deck this morning, dance upon the shore. Walk with me to freedom through the streets of all the more. Come up on the deck this morning, give your hand to me. See the flag that flies above this new land of the free. Come up on the deck this morning, dance upon the shore. Walk with me to freedom through the streets of all the more. And walk with me to freedom through the streets of all the more. I want to be the freedom through the streets of Baltimore. We're back. And by the way, if there's anyone out there wondering if it's a bit warm sitting in a Southern California backyard wearing a heavy Irish fisherman sweater, a scarf, and a cap, well, the answer is yes. Regardless, before the world changed in 2020, I was visiting Ireland two to three times a year. So it's really wonderful to be able to connect to that music and dance once again. Now, let's get back to some more readings. Our next author, Alice McDermott, visited Hoko Polizzo in 2020. Her novel, Charming Billy, 
won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Her most recent novel, The Ninth Hour, was listed as one of the Time Magazine's top 10 novels of 2017. Welcome, Alice McDermott. Hello, Hoko Pulitzer folk. I'm going to read a few paragraphs from an essay entitled, What I Expect. Somewhere in my hopeful heart or deluded mind, I harbor a belief in divine inspiration. This may be some tattered fragment of my Catholic education. It is most certainly not a product of my own experience as a writer. As a reader, though, I buy the assertion wholeheartedly. The Holy Spirit, the muse, divine, divine inspiration. Think about it. Our need for fiction is not biological. It's not even practical. We no longer need stories to tell us how to avoid being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. We no longer need stories to explain to us in terms we can understand, huddled in the dark, hoping the sun will return, the workings of the natural world. Certainly, we no longer need stories to show us how to save our immortal souls. And yet, our need for fiction, our longing for fiction, not to mention our making of fiction, persists. I suppose you could argue that this need is indeed only some vestige of that earlier primitive practical habit of mind, that it is some appendix or tailbone of the brain or of the heart, that evolution, our growing sophistication, our vast knowledge has made obsolete. But such an argument hardly accounts for the complexity, the variety, the sheer volume of story we humans produce or for the relentless way we continue to produce it, to seek it out, to fold it into our experience and our memories. I'm with Faulkner when he claims that literature is not merely the record of man's puny, inexhaustible voice, but one of the pillars and props of humanity itself. I'm with Harold Bloom when he claims that Shakespeare did not merely illustrate what it is to be human, he invented it, brought our complex humanity into being by revealing it to ourselves. I'm with the wide and motley cast of authors I have heard extol the beauty of Mark's Gospels or of Genesis, of the Old and New Testaments as a whole, and I am unwilling to believe that the Creator, having dabbled in the writer's craft then, would have abandoned that craft to us amateurs for the next 2,000 years. I find it a matter of simple logic, that if we novelists have, over all these centuries, used our literature to send our appeals, our laments, our complaints, as well as our observations on the pain and the sweetness of life up to the powers that be, then surely the powers that be must, on occasion, answer in kind. I expect fiction to be that answer in kind. And finally, lest we forget, I expect fiction to be a continual source of surprise and delight. For 36 years, Catherine has helped to make Ho Ko Polizzo a continual source of surprise and delight by bringing us the word, capital W, and the music capital M. Thank you, Catherine. Alice, thank you for reminding us about how important stories are in the world and for expressing our gratitude for the inspired work that Patrick and Catherine have done to bring great literature to our community. Well said. Our next author, Mike McCormick, 
visited us in 2018. Mr. McCormick's novel, Solar Bones, won the Dublin Literary Award. The Guardian subtitled their review, An Extraordinary Hymn to Small Town Ireland. Here is an excerpt from Mike's recent visit with The Writing Life. Read a small bit uh, from near the beginning of the novel on page 66. And it's a piece where himself and, and Marid, and they're in, they're, in their early, they're in their early 50s. His wife. Yeah, yeah. and they have two grown-up kids in their early 20s. And um, this is one of the things they do is they go for a walk in the evening and that. And um, here they recount, Marid recounts a program that she's seen on television. And uh, they both have different interpretations of what they've looked at and what they've seen. So we pulled on light jackets and we set off as night was beginning to close in. Starting off along the main road and then skirting the village by the sea path across the Black Hill. The breeze crisp on our faces and as we walked, Murray told me about a documentary she had watched recently. Telling me, there's a nomadic tribe in Mon Mongolia who crossed the Gobi Desert, herding their goats and their sheep and horses, and pitching their yurts on the outsides of towns and cities to trade with the settled communities. And there's nothing odd in any of that, but what's really interesting was that at the center of the tribe, there was a holy woman, or witch doctor, who has the usual tasks of healing and invoking the gods, all the shamanic and medicinal duties, a vocation that has come down to her through the family, a line of apostolic succession which meant that she had this other function also of keeping the tribe's world in balance and harmony by living her life backwards. But how do you mean living backwards? Well, I mean she walks backwards and she talks backwards and she rides her horse backwards and she gets up in the middle of the night to eat her dinner and then she goes to bed when everyone around her is beginning the, the day and why would she do that? Well, this is fascinating. It's their belief, this tribe, that if everyone is walking and talking and doing the same things in the same direction, then there's a real danger that the whole world will tip over. So one person is needed to work the opposite way, to keep the world balanced. Well, that makes sense. That's basic engineering. Any load-bearing structure will topple over if it doesn't have a balance and counterweight. Cranes will topple over if they're not properly weighted. I don't think they understood it as engineering. Well, probably not, but that's what it is. Some mechanisms have to be countergeared to keep them tensioned. All I could think of was that only a woman would get a job like that. Maybe only a woman could do a job like that. One weighty and contrary soul to keep the world in balance. So there they are, the two of them out walking in the evening. That reading is certainly an appreciation of amazing women. Thank you, Mike, for helping us to celebrate both the amazing Catherine McLaughlin and Patrick Kennedy. Our next guest, Theo Dorgan, last joined Hoko Polizzo in celebration of Irish Evening 2014. Poet, writer, lecturer, translator, and documentary screenwriter, Theo Dorgan has published numerous books of prose and poetry. His awards include the Listowel Prize for Poetry and the O'Shaughnessy Prize. Welcome, Theo Dorgan. Greetings from Dublin in the heart of winter. I asked myself if it were possible to sum up what Hoko Polizzo has been doing all these 44 years. And the phrase that comes to me is building civility. It's respect for and it's promotion of the life of the mind, the life of the heart, the life of art, the life of poetry, has been exemplary and has enriched the lives of thousands. I consider it a great honour to have been part of your Irish series and to have travelled across that wonderful bridge between Ireland and America that Pardick and Catherine between them have built and maintained all these years. And believe me, that traffic has been two ways. We, in our turn, so many of us, have benefited and from and treasured the warmth, the hospitality of Hoko Polizzo. As Catherine and Podrick move on to whatever they will do next, because I cannot imagine them ever being idle, they leave behind a remarkable inheritance. And I wish for Anne and Ed, as they take up these responsibilities, that they will have joy of the work. I thought I'd read two poems to, as a contribution to the celebration. We're on the eve of the winter solstice here, and this poem touches on that, the turning just before we turn back towards the light. It's called A Woman in Winter. She walks the ditch, contented and alone, 
sends up a flight of crows with every stone. Beyond the ridge, beyond the frost-gripped fence, the light pours down on lands of innocence. A tree stands out against the winter snow, a tree her mother planted years ago. The sun flares up and shines through bitter cold on sudden flashing ornaments of gold. I think all of those who, like Catherine and Paul, and all of their many companions in the work, I think the best way to look at what they do is they have tended a garden, the garden of our imaginations, the paradise garden that we all cultures remember and celebrate, the garden we're working towards, all of us, those who in whatever ways we can offer service to others. So that's probably, no poet can ever be certain of where a poem comes from, that's probably what's behind this poem. It's called The Promised Garden. There is a garden where our hearts converse, at ease beside clear water, dreaming a whole and perfect future for yourself, myself, our children and our friends. And if we must rise and leave, take on identity and fight, each day more desperate than the last and farther from our future, that is no more than honour and respect shown to all blocked from the garden that we own. There is a garden at the heart of things. Our oldest memory guards it with her strong will. Those who by love and work attain there, bathe in her living waters, lift up their hearts and turn again to face the steep privations of the hill. They walk in the market, but their feet are still. There is a garden where our hearts converse, at ease beside clear water, dreaming a whole and perfect future for yourself, myself, our children and our friends. Long life and good heart to Catherine and Potter. Many thanks for those many years of service and inspiration and the very best of luck, Irish and American, to Anne and Ed. Thank you, Theo, for increasing our collective civility and for helping Hoko Polizzo tend the garden that Catherine and Patrick have so lovingly planted. Our final author, Colin McCann, has visited us twice, first in 1999 and again in 2013. Mr. McCann received both the National Book Award and the Dublin Literary Award for Let the Great World Spin. His most recent book, A Pyragon, was long listed for the Booker Prize and nominated for the Dublin Literary Award. A warm welcome, please, to Colm McCann. This is a tribute to the magnificent Catherine McLaughlin Hayes and uh, Porrick and everybody at uh, Hoko Polizzo, um, who down through the years have done extraordinary things. Catherine, I think you should have 36 bouquets of flowers and 36 poems written for you and all sorts of things for all the years that you've given. Uh, great joy to readers and to writers and to cultural commentators and, and all the great stuff that you have done. Uh, it's deeply appreciated and rather than read something on my own I thought I'd give you a little bit of uh, another Irishman uh, by the name of Mr James Joyce. Again Catherine thank you for everything and I'm sorry about my messy office but uh, here I am. And what do you think, says Joe, of the holy boys, the priests and the bishops of Ireland doing up his room in Maynooth in his satanic majesty's racing colours and sticking up pictures of all the horses his jockeys rode? The Earl of Dublin, no less. Ah, they ought to have stuck up all the women he rode himself, says little Alf, <laughs> says J.J. Considerations of space influence their lordship's decision. Will you try another, citizen, says Joe. Yes, sir, says he, I will. You, says Joe, beholden to you, Joe, says I, may your shadow never grow less. Repeat that dose, says Joe. And Bloom was talking and talking with John Weiss, and he quite excited with his dunduckety mud-coloured mug on him and his old plum eyes rolling about. Persecution, says he. Persecution, all the history of the world is full of it perpetuating national hatred among nations. But do you know what a nation means? Says John Weiss. Yes, says Bloom. What is it? 
says John Moyes. A nation, says Bloom, a nation is the same people living in the same place. By God then, says Ned laughing, if that's so, I'm a nation for I'm living in the same place these past five years. So of course everyone had a laugh at Bloom and says he, trying to muck out of it, or also living in different places. That covers my case, says Joe. What is your nation, if I may ask? As says the citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here, Ireland. And that's a scene from the pub uh, in uh, Ulysses. And um, really, uh, you've brought Ireland to so many of us, Catherine, and, and you've brought literature uh, into um, an extraordinary, extraordinarily exciting place. And we deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate it, uh, writers and readers alike. And um, I'm glad you're still on the board and I hope to see you soon. And uh, all best wishes. Take care. Thank you. Ah, 36 bouquets indeed. Thank you, Colin McCann. Well done. By the way, how fitting that this evening began and ended with readings from the great James Joyce. Now, it is truly time to celebrate. With the help of all the poets and authors, musicians and dancers, this evening has shown us the impact of 44 years of Hoko Polizzo programs. I know I speak for myself, the board, and the entire Hoko Polizzo community when I say thank you. And ask everyone to raise a glass, please, in honor of the selfless work of Patrick Kennedy and Catherine McLaughlin Hayes. Slancha. And what better way to continue the celebration than with more music and dance? So sit back, relax, enjoy the festivities with your Roscommon Rosie or your favorite adult beverage. My name is Martin O'Malley, and this is O'Malley's March. We want to thank Hoko Polizzo for having us here on the 44th annual Night of Irish Music and Poetry. Uh, I want to introduce the members of the band. To my immediate right, musician to the Popes, man who plays a Dixieland harp and a Celtic trombone, Mr. Jared Denhart, as well as bagpipes and all sorts of other things. Jared. Directly behind him. Uh, bass player extraordinaire, Mr. Pete Miller on the bass. On the other side of the, uh, the stage, uh, playing electric guitar, proud graduate of Loyola, Blakefield, Mr. Ralph, my mother was Irish, Rinaldi. <laughs> Ralph. Directly behind me, from the banks of the broad, majestic Herring Run in Baltimore City, Mr. Jamie Boom Boom Wilson. <laughs> on the drums, in case you hadn't guessed. And to my uh, uh, immediate left, uh, politically and on stage, the, the man in the middle, on the fiddle, Mr. Jimmy Egan. And over here, rounding out the page in age and musicality, on the accordion, is Mr. Sean McComiskey. All right, here we go. It's a song, a song by Shane McGowan called The Broad Majestic Shannon. The last time I saw you was down at the Greeks. There was whiskey on Sunday and tears on our cheeks. I sang you a song that was pure as the breeze on the road leading up Glenavy. I sat for a while near the cross at Fenor where young lovers would meet when the flowers were in bloom. Heard the men coming from the fair in Shinron, their hearts in Tipperary, wherever they roam, take my hand and dry your tears, babe. Take my hand, forget your fears. There's no pain, there's no more sorrow, they're all gone, gone with the years. Babe. I sat for a while near the gap in the wall, found a rusty tin can and an old hurly ball. 
heard the cards being dealt and the rosary called and a fiddler like Sean da-da-da. And the next time I see you will be down at the Greeks there'll be whiskey on Sunday and tears on our cheeks for it's stupid to laugh and it's useless to ball for a rusty tin can and an old hurly ball. Tears, baby, take my hand, forget your fears, baby, there's no pain, there's no more sorrow, they're all gone, gone with the years, baby. So I woke as day was dawn and where a small bird sang and leaves were falling where once we watched the rowboats landing by the broad majestic shaft.
And I shall find some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veil of morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and the noon a purple glow, and the evening's filled with linnet's wings. Yes, I will arise and go now for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping and low sounds by the shore. While I stand upon the roadway or on the pavement's gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. Farewell, Clonbur, your green valleys and your streams, the lake isles and your mountains, where I have lately been. May the kindness of your people, like your gentle peace endure. Farewell, 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 sweet Clonber. In a world more full of sorrows than you can understand, there's a place where all your worries are eased by God's great hand, where the journey of a lifetime is a short road from the shore to the ancient Lake Isle Castle that guards the rising past to sweet Clonbur. In the quiet of the evening, as the sunset paints the sky, take a walk down by her wild woods, very deep and wonder why. If truth and love and beauty are the things that will endure, why do I mourn to leave a while the friends and soft green hills of sweet clumber? Your green valleys and your streams, your lake high and your mountains, where I have lately been. May the kindness of your people, like your gentle peace endure. Farewell, farewell.
This is a song that uh, I wrote probably 10, 20 years ago. It's a song called The South Baltimore Lullaby or The Ballad of St. Mary's Star of the Sea. Where the city lights dance on the waves And a cool breeze blows off the bay When your limbs lie down as your rest is found At the dimming of the day I know then that I'll think of you And I pray you'll think of me And may St. Mary's light guard you tonight as the stars watch over the sea. Oh, 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 oh. As the years go by and the banshees cry, marks the time as souls must flee. From our short stay here to the rest that's near When the calm returns to the sea Though time and space pull us apart In my heart you'll always be So may St. Mary's light guard you tonight As the stars watch over the sea St. Mary's light guard you tonight as the stars watch over the sea.
And with that, we end our 44th celebratory evening of Irish music and literature. Thank you all so very much for joining us. And a very special thank you to each and every author, musician, and dancer who has made this evening outstanding. It has been my pleasure and honor to host you this evening. And I look forward to next year when I and all of the folks at Hoko Polizzo meet again with you live and in person. So please enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.